And today, by the grace of God, out of uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, I want to preach on God's plan of salvation. Not the Baptist, not the Catholic, not the Church of Christ, not even yours or my plan. And I know some people, they don't like when you say God had a plan. They think that, you know, whatever, you know. But God does have a way that he saves everybody. Uh, You know, you may be sitting beside the road in a car and get saved. You may be at church. You may be at home. You may be anywhere. But he still saves the same way. Just like, because this is a birth. This is a birth that God, every birth is the same. They come, you, you, we're all here by the same means. Chapter 1 of 1 Peter, verse 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time wherein ye greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be you are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and glory uh, praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ whom having not seen ye love in whom though now ye see him not yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you in these ten verses three times The Apostle Peter uses this word salvation. If you look this word salvation up in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, it means the same. It means to rescue. It means means safety. It means deliver. It means health. And it means saved. Someone that is rescued is not the same person. You can't be rescued and be the same person. And so I want to speak on this or talk about this, preach about this, because when I saw my family professing to be saved, acting the way they act on public uh, the uh, social media at a wedding, uh, it just kind of made me think, these people profess, Brother Ray, to be saved. They're church-going people. They go to church. They go to Baptist church. And yet they had this, uh, this is my family, so you don't get mad about it. It's my family. (laughs) They had this, like a piece of plywood, and they had martini or whatever, champagne. There was, it was double-sided, and there was 39, I counted them, on that 39 on both sides. So you could just walk up and get you a shot, you know. There's something wrong with that salvation. There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong when you can go to a Baptist church and think that that's all right. Because we're different. We're saved. We're different. Now, I think one of the things where we get lost in this thing of salvation is we think you can come anytime you want to come, say anything you want to say, do anything you want to do, and you're okay. That's not Bible. The Bible says this in John 44. Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. You know what? You can't come and get saved anytime you want to. What we're forgetting to tell these people is, if God don't call you, you can't get saved. You can't have this gift of salvation if there's not a Holy Spirit that's knocking at your door. And we're letting people just say, Oh, I believe in 
in Jesus, if somebody come to you, Brother Jordan, and said, you're on your way to hell, and you know you're on your way to hell, and they said, do you want to go to hell? Well, if you're smart, you don't want to go. If you know that there's a lake of fire and that you're going to be there forever and somebody tells you that, of course you don't want to go if you've got any sense at all in your, in your head. Do you want to know Jesus? Yes. Confess. There's more to it than that. We have to be called. There has to be a call that goes forth. That's why Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. Jesus Christ on, on Calvary made it possible for every man, woman, boy, or girl in the whole wide world from the beginning of time to the end of time to come to know him. Amen. He's going to call people and people will refuse to come. Now, how does he call? He calls through this Bible. That's why it's important. That's why the devil fights this scripture, Brother Jordan. That's why he fights it. That's why he, 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 uh, he, he uh, takes this Bible and he makes it, perverts this Bible. He, he takes the NIV itself, has numbers of times that it takes the word of blood, the word blood out. Why? Because they want you to think that you can come any way you want to come, any time you want to come, and do anything you want to do, but that is not true. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing. That's why lost people don't come to church anymore. You know why? Because when Brother Foster gets up here and he lays the hammer down, it makes him feel bad, and you should feel bad. I didn't feel good when, the, when they preached the Bible to me. It made me feel uncomfortable. Why? Because I was guilty. I, I didn't stand in front of the judge and say, I'm innocent. I'm guilty. And a person that's lost without God, they're guilty, and it's the preaching of the Scriptures that calls them because that gives them faith and confidence that there is a God in heaven Amen. scriptures then in revelation he's, he says the spirit and the bride say come that's the saints you know what we do if you're truly saved you don't want nobody to go to hell <laughs> there's not a person I don't care how bad they don't like me I don't want them to go to hell I don't care what they've done to me I don't want them to go to hell why because there's something God's put in me that wants me to see everybody because I've seen it in my own life people that didn't like me got saved and we became best friends why because we have uh, kindred spirits why it's called the Holy Spirit and I want to tell you something it's our job to live a life you shouldn't have to wear no what would Jesus do shirt for people to know you're a Christian I'm not a preacher against them but I'm just saying you, sh you should live a life where they say there's something different about that, pe that person right there uh, it ain't in the kind of hairdo you got it ain't in all of that you know it ain't in that but they should see because see I've been around people I've been around people and everywhere I go, it's the same. They're filthy mouth, they're filthy minded, and their language is different. And when I don't participate in that kind of language and that kind of action, they look at me and say, he's a weirdo. And that's all right, I'll take that claim. That's okay, because I'm supposed to be that way. Peculiar. The saints, but the Holy Spirit. You know what the Holy Spirit's doing? He's walking up and down here today. There's not a person in here he's not talking to uh, he's telling you he's right he's right you need to listen because I am right not because of me but because of this because of this Bible and I want to tell you the Holy Spirit uh, uh, when I, I got under conviction uh, and going to church I wouldn't even went to church because I didn't come from a religious family the only reason I went to church was uh, they said there was some girls over there. And I've always been fond of girls myself. I don't take that the wrong way. I found one and I ain't been looking for none since I found that one. <laughs> Amen. I'll stay with her until they throw dirt on my face. Amen. That's, and that's fine. I like it like that. I'm not complaining. But that's the reason I went. See, that's was God's lure. Yeah. Amen. That's a good lure. No, if you're a guy. Hey man, don't don't get all don't get all self righteous and acting like there's something wrong with that. No, there's something wrong if you're a guy and you want to go see guys. Amen. Hey man, it's normal. But there's Brother Hayes, my first pastor. He got to preaching, and after a while, I got to stop looking at the girls, and I started pointing my mind toward the the 
up here at the pulpit. Why? Because God started hammering me with the scriptures. He started, my brother and other people in my life would live a life in front of me. They never stood in front of me like some people think you're supposed to. You're going to go to hell. They never done that. They lived a life in front of me that was different. I knew my brother. We was raised up together from the time I was born. I've known him all my life. And he changed when he got saved. Uh, oh, I say, when Brother Hay started preaching, my mind changed. I wasn't interested in girls because I'd go home. When I'd drive home, all I could hear was that preacher say, God loves you. God wants to save you. You're going to die and go to hell if you don't get saved. You know what that was? You can get away from the saints. You can get away from the scriptures. But you can't get away from the Spirit. Why? He'll slip in under the door somewhere and slip into your car somewhere and he'll go home with you. And while on the way home, all you can say is, would you please stop? Brother Brian, I remember it vividly. Uh, you remember the show, Charlie's Angels? Yeah. I, they asked me, so you going to church tonight? I said, no, I'm going to stay home and watch Charlie's Angels. Huh? Yeah, man. It wasn't Charlie's Angels I was interested in. I wasn't interested in what that preacher is going to make me feel like dirt again. And he didn't mean that he loved me. Huh? Hey, man. Huh? I love him for telling me the truth. You know what? I said on that couch, I can't even tell you what Charlie's Angels was about. Huh? But I can tell you this it was a miserable time. Why? Because you can get away from the preacher, you can get away from the people in your life, but you cannot get away from the Holy Spirit. He'll stay right on the couch while you've got Charlie's angels on. And you'll say, I don't understand what they're talking about. Why? Because there's got to be a call. We're missing it. We're missing this. We're thinking you can get saved. Just to, You know, there's so many people say, well, they say, I, 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 this is what everybody says, I, I'm saved and the FBI can't find them. Uh, I want to tell you something. When I married my wife, I didn't go any place else looking for women. You know why? Because my heart was happy with her. And there's something wrong with these people that say, "Oh, I know Jesus," and you couldn't find him on a couldn't find him on a Sunday uh, if your life depended on it. Something wrong with that. That's just that's just my thoughts. Now. There's, got to, there's the call, but there's also, there's the conditions. You know, there, there's conditions, you know. I, I want to say, uh, given birth, you know, there's conditions to that. Everybody, uh, I can't give birth. I, I hope you know that. If you can't, see Brother Ray after the service and he'll explain it to you. <laughs> But there's some conditions because have you ever noticed, Brother Jordan, these people that live like the devil, they talk about how good they are. Yeah. Uh, they're sitting there with a shot glass in their hand, a cigarette in their hand, uh, and somebody else's, somebody else's wife in their arms. Uh, I know that's, that, that rubs people the wrong way, but that's the way it is. You know, that's, this is, we're talking about the real world here. We're not talking about what goes on in our homes. Uh, what are the conditions? They're found in Ephesians 2. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, is a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Right. Now, what, I'm what, what disturbed me about my family was that they're sitting here with all this uh, champagne and, and attending a Baptist church. Evidently, they're failing them. We're failing them. We're failing to get because we're afraid people will get, they'll leave. They're already gone. They're going to hell. What else can you do to hurt them? It's our responsibility. If you're here and a preacher, it's your responsibility to tell them. You've got to be born again. Amen. You can't get born again any time. We've got two babies. I sat here. They had kind of a tug of war between the, the noise they was making while Jordan was. I thought it was wonderful myself. Yeah. Amen. That's the sound of life. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, it hasn't changed. It took nine months for them to get here. Yeah. Right. Uh, 
They just didn't didn't come in here and Brother Doug announced, you know, the, they're, 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 having, they're having kids. They're having babies. It took nine months. See, what we're failing to do is we're failing to tell these people, you've you got to be born again. Amen. Huh? Listen. Listen how Jesus says. I want to say when we get up into heaven, Brother Ed, when you and I are standing on that street of gold, you know what we're going to look at each other and say? See him? That's why I'm here. First thing he says, for by grace. Huh? God's riches at Christ's expense. Huh? God's um, uh, Christ, uh, uh, you are an unmerited favor. You get there, you know. You know, really, Brother Ray, it's a blessing that we even got a church to go to. A church like this. Do you know how hard it is to find a church like this? Huh? As the old saying used to be, a needle in a haystack. It's hard to find. Hard to find pastors like Brother, Brother Doug. Hard to find them. I know. There was a time I was looking. That's hard to find. Be thankful you got this. Why? Because he tells us the conditions in which a person can get saved. Right. See, everybody I found out that wants to go to heaven by works, they live like the devil. Right. Uh, they're not good people. They're religious people. That's the worst kind. Do you know that religious people are going to be, be in the worst part of hell? Amen. I'm telling the truth. Religious people are going to be in the worst part of hell. Beyond Hitler. You say, I don't believe that. Read your Bible. Huh? God hates religion. But He loves grace. Do you know how gracious God is to you? I think about uh, I think about how good God's been to me when uh, when, when Miss Sydney was singing that song. Man, I'm telling you that that just thrilled my heart when I thought about what God's done for me. Here, I, I didn't have a ch you know how much how much percentage they would have give for me ever getting saved. It would have been less than zero. Uh, uh, I'm just telling you that's how bad it was. Didn't know nothing about God. Didn't know nothing. I mean, dumb as a coal bucket. I know a lot of y'all don't know what that is, but some of you, Brother Ray, will know he, he'll line up with all that hillbilly talk. Amen. Didn't know nothing. But the grace of God that came to my house in eastern Kentucky and sent me all the way to Mason, Ohio to look for a job. All I thought is I was going to look for a job. That wasn't what was happening. That wasn't what was going on. What was going on? God was saying, I'm going to get him up here where I can get him away from all his old crazy friends and get him up there in, heaven, uh, up there in, in Mason and get him around where he don't know nobody and get him around where, where he can just go to church with his brother and his uh, cousin's wife and a few people we know and I'm going to get him saved. What a gracious God. All I can say, thank God for his grace. Amen. That God would go that far, do that much to see that I could get saved. Take me a four hour drive from my home and put me in a uh, I'm raised in the hills man it's, it's hill country where I'm from you think these are hills they ain't, these ain't hills these are just bumps it's hills where I'm from uh, amen. amen and and you know the language is all I didn't fit in I didn't fit into these city folks they they talk real proper I'm like ooh <laughs> these are he's some weird people here you know they put all the letters on the words. I, I use half. See, we, we get by with a lot less uh, vocabulary, you know. See, y'all say you all. We say y'all. Uh, just trying to tell you. The grace of God that brought me up here. Put me in a place where I didn't have a friend in the world. Huh? Brother Jordan, you know what I spent being 18 years old? By myself. Didn't have nobody. But that was good. You know what was good about that? I didn't need no friends because the friends that I always picked were the wrong ones. Huh? They were cussing, drinking friends. Huh? And what God did is by His grace, He brought me somewhere where He could save me. And then look, well, look at this. He said, uh, he, he said, it's a gift. Now, last night, my wife, we're sitting there on the couch watching television and her phone does that little dingy ding when you get a text message our second grandson is going to be 18 years old this month he's texting her to tell her what he wants for his birthday 
<laughs> I said, that dirty dog. <laughs> I, said, I said, man, we, we ain't even, you know, we still got time. He said, he said this is what I want. And he said, here, just, just a few things in case you want to know. Uh, all right. And, you know, my wife, she said, what is this? I said, I got to see it. I said, but you know what ain't going to happen? When we go to his birthday party and we hand him the presents that we give him, I'm not going to say, Isaac, pay up. <laughs> I spent $120 here. I want my money with interest. No. You know why? Because it's a gift. You're here today and it on, ain't none of it on your account. It ain't even on your parents' account. You're here because God gave you the greatest gift. I was telling Brother Josh and a few others that we went up to the, the car show. Man, they want a lot of money for them cars. I mean, they, they want a lot of money. Huh? A lot of money. You know what? I can't afford them. I can't afford thirty and forty thousand dollars for a car to set. Now, if you want to buy me one, I'll take it. I won't even pick it out. You pick it out and give it to me. I'll take it. I don't care if it's pink. I'll drive it. But see, what I'm, my point is this: I can't afford that, but I can afford this. Why? Because God gives it to me. The greatest thing that you can ever have—the grace of God, salvation. God gives it to you. He wrapped it up on Calvary and crucified his son and let him die so you can sit here today and have the greatest gift that's ever been known to man. Praise his name today. Thank God that he gave us this gift. This gift of eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Ain't that sad? Brother Ray, wouldn't it be sad to work 70, 80 years, die and go to hell? And you sit right here on the pew and not do a thing and God take you right on into heaven. That's right. uh, next thing is that it brings God glory. See, it says not of works. But then look in verse 10. For we are His workmanship. You know, if you're any better today than you was the day you got saved, it's because of Jesus. It ain't because... You know, Jordan, he sometimes shoots over my head. He's so smart. I'm just saying that. I'm not trying to be ugly. He just <laughs> but everything is done brings Him glory. God. huh? It don't matter what walk of life you're in. If you're a bricklayer or you're a... Whatever you are, it's all God's glory. You are what you are by His glory. Everything we're done... When we stand up, you know what? I've seen these kids just bless my heart. They get up and tell how God saved them. You know what that is? That's giving God glory. Right. I've seen the older ones get up and say, "I want to." here's what most of them say. Here's what most people I've watched in this church say. First of all, I want to thank God for saving me. Yeah. Huh? You know what they're doing? They're giving God glory. They're not taking no credit for that. They know they got this far. You know you got this far only by His grace. That's right. Now, that's the conditions, but this is the part where it gets tricky. Because in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. See, in this plan of salvation, God's going to change your life. Amen. Now, Anybody in here ever read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Don't be ashamed. Every time Jesus come up on a person, when he left, they were always better off. Huh? Brother Brian, you better off? You better off. I'm better off. Brother Christian, you better off? You know what? Here's something about change. Something that is changed is not the same. Can't be. Huh? Something that has changed is not the same. A person, I want to say this, and it might make you mad. I don't think it will, but if it does, that's fine. A, my attitude toward life changed. What I mean by this, you know when voting season comes and the people that get up and they, they tell what they're for, they got one or two things they can say that I'll turn them off. If they say they're for the homosexuals, I wipe them off. 
If they say they're for abortion, I wipe them off. I don't even listen to nothing else they got to say. I don't care. They could have the best plan in the world. Why? Because I think those are two of the most wicked things you could ever do. Why? Because God's made a change in me. He's made a change. I'm not the same. Uh, I'm not going to vote for somebody just because he can make the economy better. I'd rather suffer and know that these babies have a life to live. The tra greatest tragedy in America was committed in the 70s when they thought it was legal to abort little babies. That's the, one of the most wicked things we've ever done. And God's going to judge us for that. Because I'm telling you, if you've ever been born again, you don't think that's right. I don't believe it. Things that change are not the same. You know, it's like buying a new car. It's not the same as the old one. I don't care if it's the same body style and all that. It ain't the same. You ain't going to take a car that's got 200,000 and drive it over here on the lot and buy one just like it with zero miles and they both be the same. Because the one you drove in probably doing all kinds of <laughs> like that, you know. A lot of things are loose. That new one has a new, you know, they call it the new car smell. I, I just, I, I just, when I want a new car, I just drive over and smell them and get my old one and leave. <laughs> they want more than I'm willing to pay. Uh huh. Not only when it changes your life, it changes the side you're on. Amen. You used to be an enemy of God. Yeah. You used to be, you used to think that all the people went to church. That's a waste of time. That was a waste of time. Just go to church. That's a waste. You know, and I've heard people, they've even told my wife, what do you do in church twice on Sunday? And Rhonda said, well, we, we sing and pray and we pr preach. Really? You do that twice? But you know what, Brother Jordan? They don't care to go to the bar twice. They call it bar hopping. That means they hop from one over to the other. See, they can't get enough, but see, it's weird if we can't get enough. Huh? And there's something wrong with that. You know why? Why I can't get enough of this? I like it when the Spirit gets moving. I like it when I can feel God around. Why? Because I've changed sides. I don't think like I used to. I don't do like I used to do. I don't act like I used to act. My language is different. The people that I like being around is different. Huh? I, I'm, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not against lost people. I love them, but we don't go. I, I, I don't have any lost friends that we go anywhere with. Right? Not, I don't have nothing in common with them. Amen. You know. But then, in verse two of this chapter, it says, "Where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience." You know what? Who you serve changes. Huh? Yeah. yeah, I'm not. I'm not serving the same person. No. See, uh, Brother Jordan hit it right there when he talked about you know serving yourself. It's all for me. You know, you know the four musketeers all for one and one for all. That ain't how it is. It's a. Uh, it's it's all for three. Me, myself, and I. Right. <laughs> that's what it is when you're lost. Number one. That's why you can't deal with lost people a lot of times because they're unreasonable. Right. See, I want to tell you something. When you get your life changed. You serve a different. You serve different. You you love people more than you used to. I seen a guy at the car show yesterday. He said, "The more I'm around," he had a shirt. It said, "More I see, more I'm around people, the more I love cars." <laughs> I can sometimes relate to that, but it's not true. I love people. You know why? Because of who's who's uh, who's inside of me. When I think about these people that I'm talking to, you, where I got this message from, where I thought about this, it breaks my heart when I think about them. I could name their names to you right now. You wouldn't know them, but I could name their names. And I want to think about them. When I think about them dying and going to hell, it don't bring me no joy. It breaks my heart. Why? Because I want them to know this God that I serve, this Jesus I know, the one who gave His life on Calvary for me. I want them to know Him. Amen. Uh, it's, it's sad listen in Hebrews 12 talks about God's chastisement that's one of the things about this salvation you know I never did whip the neighbor's kids even though I wanted to huh amen and even though they needed it 
I didn't do it. You know why they ain't mine? Right. Let me read this to you. And you know this. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says in verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. I, I see one of the greatest tragedies in parenthood today is there's no chastisement for these children. And what you're doing is you're teaching them, I don't love you. Because God says, I'll chasten them, number one, because I love them. You're not going to stand in God's face. Even, you know, and, and I'm not the, I'm not the, I'm probably not the most popular grandpa, but my grandkids don't disrespect me. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You say, well, they're your precious grandkids. Them little heathens will get the devil beat out of them. <laughs> Amen. If their mom and dad don't get a hold of them, and especially if they disrespect her, which they don't, but they're little, they, they try themselves. You know how little kids try them. They try to push themselves around. Like, go lay down, you know. See, God, God, here's what God does. The Lord himself chast chastises. You know what? If you can do whatever you want to do and God don't never say nothing to you, you better check up what you got. There's something wrong with that. Huh? Why? Because the Lord chastises. You know what he does? When we was in school... They had paddles. Any of those? Any y'all remember getting paddled at school? I got one. Yeah, you don't. You didn't have no paddles at your school. Okay. Why did you raise your hand? <laughs> See, when I went, even the teachers could discipline you. Now they're wondering why these kids are out of hand. There's no chastisement. There's none of this. You're guilty. Put your hands on the desk. You didn't want to put your hands on the desk where I was at. No. Because they had, it was basically a boat oar with the handle cut off. And them teachers, they were kind of sadistic. They kind of, it was like, almost like, uh. Yeah. They, you know, they would bring the thunder man <laughs> I'm just telling you that's the way it was and you know what we're better for it you know what you know why because you can't get away from this bible and expect good things to happen because the bible says the Lord himself chasing us and if you can if you can't if you don't get chased in something wrong but he chases because he loves you huh you know what when my dad said no I didn't like it but when I look back on it, I realize he was doing it for my own good. Right. When he said, you can't go here, he was doing it because he know, he knowed better than I did. Right. You know, you need to watch over your kids. Just like God watches over his kids, don't go there. Right. <clears throat> we would kind of got on a discussion amongst my family about uh, drinking. We don't drink, and we don't like drinking. But it seems like the modern church thinks that's okay. Sure. Now, why would you... It's like the modern church wants to walk right up to the edge and stand there and see if they fall over. But I want to tell you something. I don't want to do that, Brother Christian. I want to get so far from the edge that, that I don't even know where the edge is. Why? I don't want... There's nothing good ever come out of alcohol. Right. Nothing. Right. Nothing good. Divorces, alcohol. There's people today that have walked out to the cemetery and buried their children because some drunk come home last night and run over their kids and their wife. And they're, you're going to tell me that you want to walk up to the edge and hold hands with that? I'm trying to tell you, God won't let you do that if you're born again. You say, well, preacher, I, you know, we're living in the modern day. We might be modern day, but we're still old time Christians. We're still old time Christians. Amen. Did you know this? It says, if you endure. That's the length. You know my dad decided how long the spanking was? <laughs> I just say, hey, have mercy. Yeah, right. 
I heard one preacher say when his dad started whipping him as a kid, he said, I found the best way to soften the blows was get up close to him. He said, if you'll tuck up yourself real close to your daddy when he's spanking you, he can't hit you as hard. Uh, you know what? When you know you've messed up, get up real close to him. And maybe he'll have mercy on you. Huh? Just get up real close. When he starts to swing, he won't get with the, the, the whole thing. Let's say here last of all, he'll consecrate you. That word's just a fancy word. He'll set you apart. You know, he said, wherefore come out from among them. Who's that them? That's them out there. That's lost. Come out and be separated. See, what I'm having a problem with is these people, they don't have no separation. They don't want to be different. They want to, they want to mingle with the other crowd. I don't want to mingle with them. I'm too much like them now that I, for my own good. See, here's the thing about separation if someone has your heart it's not hard to be devoted to them that's why it hasn't been hard for me to be married to Rhonda we've had hard times we've went through them together you know why she's got my heart somebody gets your heart you know the problem brother Ray is these people God ain't got to, never got their heart huh? you know why because preachers are failing they're afraid that somebody will get mad and what are you going to do? You, you say, I'm going to run them off. They're not here anyway. They're just sitting there in bodily form. Their heart ain't here. See, God wants you to be here physically, but He wants your heart here. He wants you to say, man, this right here is the most important place on this earth. I want to do everything I can to do what God wants me to do. He wants your heart. Amen. That's what that word consecrate means. It means to set apart or to devote. Huh? You know, you know, you, you got to devote your life to Him. You know, I'm still learning. You know, I think I figured the Bible out. <laughs> and then I read it again. I'm like, uh-oh. Something else. It's bigger than I think. It's deeper than I think. Huh? See, I, I think this, if... If... If you're set apart for God, you'll be devoted to His house. Amen. There's something wrong. You know, I've never went to somebody else's house and spent the night. I've always went home with Rhonda. That's our house. That's where I'm supposed to go. I don't go home with these other women. They're all strange to me. That's the way it's supposed to be. Amen. See, I'm devoted to her. She's devoted to me. You know, it's just like this. You know, I, I, I don't get it, Brother Brian. People that can miss church and it don't bother. Sure. I've told you, I had this lady when I pastored. Her dad was, he eventually died. And every Sunday I'd walk over to the church and she'd blow the horn and she's going by. And I'm like, hello. Well, when her dad died, I thought, sure enough, he'll, she'll come. She went by the next Sunday. Doot, doot. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, well, I see you in the funny papers. <laughs> you know? Why? The house of God didn't mean nothing. Huh? I want to tell you something. Something don't mean nothing to you for long, it'll be shut down. Hmm. What God needs is your heart so you'll put your body and soul and spirit into his house this I'm going to tell you something folks we ain't got much time this thing's about to dwindle down it's, I mean all this stuff that's going about all it is doing it's, it is told to us out of the Bible as in the days of Lot figure it out I don't like it but it's going to be like that you might as well get a hold of something real good and that and you might as well get a hold of something and say praise God I'm going to stand for Jesus no matter what comes if it costs me everything I'm trying to tell you his house will be the thing that you'll need when this thing comes to an end you'll need the fellowship of these, these other people Ray you're going, to, you're going to need everybody in here and everybody's going to need you just like me we're going to need each other because hard times is coming 
You know, you think, you think you've been through hard times, you ain't seen nothing when this bunch that's in the office gets done. I ain't got time to talk about politics because I'm about done here. Huh? Last of all, when you get separated to the Lord, your hunger changes. Huh? I remember Brother Brian as about a 17-year-old boy. I love rock and roll music. I mean, I had... We had eight tracks. You remember the eight tracks? I mean, I had... I, I mean, I had... You couldn't... I had two or three of them cases if, in the back seat. I had tons of them. I remember making a statement to myself. I hope I never quit listening to this stuff. Huh? It's been the hardest thing I've ever tried to give up. You know why? Because the devil heard that. I was lost, but he knew he heard that. But you know what? Amazing Grace sounds a lot better. What what the two sisters sung today? That was a lot better. You know why? Because of my hunger. Th you know, I never was big on reading. I didn't like school. I ain't gonna lie to you. But if I was gonna read anything, it wouldn't be history. It wouldn't be English. It'd been Louis Lamar. Y'all say, who's that? He wrote about three million westerns. I, I couldn't even tell you the last time I've seen one of them. But I can tell you the last time I've picked this up. You know why? Because my hunger has changed. Because I, I want to know more. That old song, I want to know more about him. Because he's done so much for me. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. There's strange things going on in the church today. And we're, we're sitting idly by and we're saying, well, you know, they say, we're, they say they're saved. Well, that ain't true. It ain't about what they say, Brother Jordan. You know, the, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, talking about false prophets, he said, beware of false prophets, you shall know them by the fruits. Now, if you can know a false prophet by their fruit, wouldn't you think you can know the real deal by the fruit? Huh? If you've got a tree in your yard and it's an apple tree and you've got one in the backyard that's a peach and you say, that's an apple tree and that's a peach. If that's a false prophet and that's a real one, you ought to be able to tell it. Huh? And the only way you can tell it is by your fruit. Not by your actions and not by your mouth, but by your actions. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. It disturbs me, the condition that we have allowed people to get into. Brother Josh, you come. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.